Good morning everybody, welcome to IndyCar on, oh what is it today? <laughs> I'll need to check my calendar, you know me and dates, let's get this right this morning. So, it is the 15th of May today. Ah, now, there's been a great deal of very confusing talk on the press recently about things like oil, about climate change and about climate change targets. A lot of things have happened uh, recently, actually just in the last 24 hours, various announcements have been made uh, about the environment and about global warming. Now in the middle of <coughs> fighting a campaign uh, to free Scotland from England so that we can get on with the job of being independent and going a different way, we're now forced to consider uh, the global picture because Let's face it, if sea levels are going to rise dramatically and global temperatures are going to make the weather a hell of a lot more violent, there's going to be more flooding, there's going to be more natural disasters, then we need to do something about that. Surely that is a much more pressing problem than, uh, for example, worrying about oil fields. At the moment, there are conflicting views about how to deal with climate change. But on the, the various news feeds this morning, we we're, were hearing several different stories at once about climate change. And one of them is that uh, the measurements of CO2 in the atmosphere made at the Mauna Loa, uh, which is a Hawaiian um, weather station, have measured for the first time a level of CO2 in the lower atmosphere of 415 parts per million. That doesn't sound like a lot, but the last time the, the level was that high, was five or maybe six million years ago and at that time during that period in the earth's prehistory the sea level was 25 meters deeper than it is now it's much higher than it is now so 25 meters is approximately what 80 something feet can you imagine the sea level rising 80 feet well that's basically what this level of co2 uh, will have the effect of doing over time so your sea level is going to rise 80 feet according to climate records going back to the previous era this five million year period ago now what that means is um, if that were to happen and it, it may not happen overnight obviously it's going to happen over time as ice caps melt and the sea gradually warms up that takes time to do that but if that happens then most of uh, the cities of the united kingdom and around the world would be completely underwater. They would be submerged under 80 feet of water because most cities, let's face it, are at sea level because they were built on river estuaries where they could trade, like Glasgow or London or uh, where else, Newcastle, um, Merseyside, all sorts of places around the UK, P Plymouth, all kinds of different towns and cities around the UK and around Europe would be completely submerged. The whole global map of the world would look completely different. All the low-lying countries would be completely underwater. Now, this is not just a, a sense of fear and alarm. This is not just fear-mongering. These are facts that we know from the past have already happened in periods of the Earth's history. And we know that the rising level of CO2 is largely to blame for trapping the heat in the atmosphere and overheating the oceans, causing ice, <coughs> ice caps to melt. The sea also, as it warms up, the water expands by about 4% and that pushes the sea levels up. But the question is, what do we do about it? There are other contradictory uh, stories in the newspapers and the press today uh, about North Sea oil. Now the remaining 20 billion barrels of oil in the current um, fields in the North Sea has been suggested by a, uh, a world <coughs> environmental organization should just be left in, in the ground uh, and not burned. Now that, when you think about it, okay that makes a lot of sense. You don't want to burn any more fuel and create more pollution. But at the same time you might still need some of the other things in that oil which we currently use, like chemicals, solvents, uh, things for glue, things for paint, things for plastics, you know, all kinds of different chemicals, including fertilizers, incidentally, come from the oil process. So we might still need some oil, but we don't burn it. Now the question is, uh, if we're going to be independent, have we missed the ship? Have we missed the boat in terms of the oil bonanza time and I think the answer to that has got to be yes because the past 40 years 
Britain has squandered almost all of its oil uh, money on pumping up the economy in London and paying for unemployment. Basically, that's what we wasted that money on, or rather the British government wasted that money on. But we also now know that both Shell and BP uh, are getting away without paying any taxes to the UK Exchequer because the British government has chosen not only not to tax these two oil companies, in which, incidentally, many uh, top Tories have directorships or shares in these companies, but as well as not taxing them, the British government has also given £87 million to the oil industry as a present. Now contrast that to somewhere like um, Denmark or Norway. Norway is a good one, right? Norway has not given money to its oil industry. It's taken money out of the oil industry. So instead of giving away public money to a company that's making trillions of dollars, like the British government is doing, Norway taxed the hell out of their oil and they've now got a trillion uh, dollar wealth fund which supports their entire population in comfort for forever basically everybody in the whole of, of Norway is a, a millionaire on paper and they have the most utopian society on the face of the earth because they invested that money wisely and in fact the the Norwegian oil fund believe it or not is one of in fact, in fact I think it's the biggest private equity fund on the planet so the Norwegians knew what they were doing when they saw the oil boom. The British government wasted the money on uh, de basically deindustrializing its entire country and removing all its heavy industries and then paid for the unemployment with its oil revenues and then used the rest of its oil revenues to pump up the city of London. Now what's going to happen when the oil stops flowing? What's going to happen when we can no longer burn that oil? And we're at that point now, that's the stupid thing about it, at the point where Scotland wants to be independent is the very same time that nobody dare pump the oil out and burn it because it's going to tip the earth over into a massive climate shift uh, and this biblical flooding that I've been describing which has already happened in Earth's history. So what do we do about it? We, we the Scottish people who want to be independent but feel cheated of our oil revenues. We've been cheated out of our oil revenues for 40 odd years. Do we go after that oil? Do we claim it back? Uh, do we leave it in the sea? Do we leave it under the ground? Or do we pump some of it out? What should we do with it? And I think the answer to that is much more complicated than simply either taking it all back or selling it to somebody. Um, or, or just pumping a bit of it out. It's a much more complicated picture than you would imagine. For one thing, the oil industry is extremely well established. There are hundreds of oil rigs working in the North Sea sector. Most of them are coming to the ends of their working lives as the fields gradually mature and, and play out, as they pump the oil and the gas out. But if we're moving to a completely green economy, which is what we're promising to do by 2045, then there is absolutely no point in pumping all that oil out to burn it. So there has to be, if Scotland is going to succeed as an independent country, there has to be a policy in place, even before independence, which says, or promises or pledges, that any oil that is pumped out of the North Sea after independence is not going to be used as a fuel. It's not going to be burned. Uh, it's not going to add to the climate catastrophe. So any oil that is pumped out needs to be uh, refined and distilled into the various chemicals that it needs uh, to be uh, broken down into, rather than being burned. Now remember, oil is one of these amazing substances that can be transformed into virtually anything. Oil can be trans transformed into gas, for example. Gas can be transferred into oil. Oil can be transferred into plastic. Plastic can actually be transformed back into gas using a system called a, a cracker. A cracker is just a thing that breaks up all of the molecules of something and reorganizes them into a new chemical f format. Uh, and such chemical industries actually already exist and could be developed further. So it's possible that oil can be pumped and not a single drop of it burned in the process. And then as we 
use that oil in different ways, it should then be targeted at things which are no longer throw away. In other words, we don't just use the material up and throw it into the environment as we've been doing for the last 40 or 50 years. So there needs to be on the back of this a, a massive new investment in the chemicals industry and a, a link up between the chemicals industry and the recycling industry which recycles current waste plastics that we have all lying around in the environment at the moment and needs to be cleaned up. So my point today really is that when we think about oil and we think about what we've been cheated out of over the last 40 years, remember that if the Tories and the British government believes that the age of oil is at an end and the country is going to decarbonise, then the value of oil as a fuel is going to drop. And if it does that, and the British government is already propping up the oil industry with public money, it's not going to want to throw more money at the oil industry to help it out of its predicament. In fact, somebody said many years ago, the point at which Scotland will become independent is the point at which we run out of oil. But it might not be that. It might be the point at which oil is no longer a valuable commodity to the United Kingdom or anybody else. When it loses its value, remember something about oil, and that is North Sea oil is hard to extract. It costs money to pull it out of the ground. Uh, and we know that because when the oil industry went into that convulsion in 2009, was it, after the credit crash, the oil industry laid off about half its staff. It just axed them all. And it learned to extract oil with far fewer staff. So it cut its costs, but it can't cut them anymore. So whatever happens to the oil price, if it starts to go down as pressure on from climate change uh, protesters and pressure on the environment grows to such an extent that we can no longer burn that oil, then the oil value is going to get to a point where it's not worth pumping it out of the North Sea anymore. And we're not very far away from that time at the moment. I don't believe uh, we will make it to the end of this decade and still have oil at the price it's at at the moment, it will decline because it's almost inevitable that everybody is decarbonizing from the Chinese who are rapidly installing electric cars everywhere across their country. There's electric cars, hundreds of manufacturers have been set up in China. They are miles ahead of the West in terms of electric cars, electric motorcycles. Everything in China is being electrified at the moment and they're installing wind turbines and solar panels everywhere in China. They really are taking it seriously. They know they've got a pollution problem anyway and they're industrious enough and wealthy enough to do something about it. Scotland here, we're standing at a kind of crossroads. If we're going to go for independence, I think we need to be brave enough to let go of the oil. I don't mean give it to England, but I mean let go of it as a, a resource for combustion and start to think of it as a reusable resource for chemicals, for fertilizers, for solvents, and for other useful components in manufacturing, not just single-use plastics anymore. They need to be made illegal, and they need to be fully recycled, but more using these plastics for much larger structures, car body panels, for example, things like that. Plastics use less energy to mold them. So car body panels made from reinforced plastics uh, are far more carbon friendly, much more environmentally friendly than say a steel panel, which is made from a material which uses phenomenal amounts of heat energy to smelt the steel. We've heard that the steelworks uh, in Scunthorpe is on the brink of financial collapse this week as well due to Brexit. And it could be that these hot industries like coal, like oil uh, and like steel making are gradually going to wane and eventually end up at a very minimal level. We will always need a little bit of steel for machines and engines and bearings. But largely we need to move to more low temperature materials such as plastics and aluminium which are far easier um, to melt and mould and rework and recycle than steel is. Plus they don't rust obviously, it has that major advantage over uh, steel. So uh, as far as Scotland is concerned, as far as fighting this uh, campaign to become independent is concerned, I think we have to look at not 
playing the oil card anymore. Let's play the green card completely. Let's look at tide energy. Believe it or not, there is far more energy in the waters moving around the coastline of Scotland than there probably is in all the North Sea oil. And not only that, but those tidal movements are perpetual. They are going to last for billions of years to come since the tides are powered by the moon as it orbits the Earth. That being the case, if we move purely to tidal and wind energy and maybe some solar and biomass and other smaller uh, contributory factors, our entire economy can be electrified. Anything that has to run on gas can run on hydrogen produced by electricity. Long-term storage of hydrogen can be solved by storing it as ammonia, as we now know. And these are the technologies that the government here should be investing in. If the SNP is entirely serious about decarbonizing, and I, I take it that they are, I take them at their word, there needs to be major government investment in massive infrastructure projects to massively modernize places like Grangemouth, to take oil and break it apart into useful commodities, no longer burning it and not pumping so much of it. Even if that means buying up Ineos and getting rid of Ratcliffe and his crowd, to stop them profiteering from burning oil. If we're really serious about saving the planet from an 80 foot sea level rise, then we need to start casting off this uh, baggage from the past because we're carrying this grievance around about the stolen oil. There's no point in that now because if that oil is going to be worthless in the next 10 years, <clears throat> then we're, we're just going to be moaning about nothing. We might get 10 years of oil revenues that are going to decline and de decline and decline. It's at this exact point in time, actually, that the British government is most likely uh, to give in to Scotland's demands for independence because when they see the value of barrels of oil starting to decline and the public pressure to stop pumping oil gets too great, then the Tories will realise that the cash cow is no longer a cash cow. They're going to have to look to somewhere else to find their money. Uh, and Scotland is no longer going to be that cash cow because all that will be left will be Scotland's own energy resources. And those resources, if we are independent, will not belong to England and cannot be uh, purloined by the British government anymore. So we're standing at a crossroads where we need to decide that it might be time for us to let go of oil as, as a big resource. It's still going to be a resource, but it's not going to be a fuel anymore. And we need to stop burning it and start conserving it and reusing the things that we make from it. So all the polymers and the chemicals and the solvents that we derive from oil, not to mention the lubricants, things that grease the wheels of industry, that grease the, <laughs> grease the wheels literally of every form of transport. We need to embrace that and we're already starting to do that. But I think what is needed, and I've said this before, is a commitment along the same sort of scale that uh, John F. Kennedy committed America to landing a man on the moon within a decade. It needs that level of industrial commitment where the government gives government contracts to companies to decarbonize rapidly within 10 years. Let's say they say we want to decarbonize by 2040 and the British or the Scottish government, when we're independent, will be pumping, pump framing these industries to kickstart them, to get this done in time to meet these climate targets or to be ahead of them. These are not just uh, side issues that don't affect everybody, they're going to affect everyone. Eventually they will affect everybody and every animal and every plant on the planet. None of it, nothing on this planet that lives is going to be unaffected by the rising temperatures. And we need to start waking up to this and start to realise that we need to adjust the way we live. Unless we do that, then there is no point in carrying on because the human species is not going to make it beyond this century. We're going to drown ourselves in flood water. We're going to submerge ourselves in our own filth and our own rubbish uh, because of the wasteful consumerist society that we've constructed. It's time to really combine things I would like to see, I'm not sure if it will happen, but I would like to see the Green Party and the SNP get together. And I would like to see them develop a fully rounded policy 
on decarbonisation for the whole of Scotland, a complete plan worked out by both parties together. The Green Party has expertise in this that the SNP might lack. The SNP is the political might uh, and the support of the population to make it happen. But it needs commitment. And unless the political commitment is there, it's not going to happen. I mean, I can bang on about this as much as I like in the car, but unless the politicians decide to do this, it's not going to happen. I think it would be a huge selling point for independence to have this worked out in advance. To have a plan in place that not only decarbonises all of Scotland, but sets it on a course to complete self-sufficiency in everything, and a level of um, a, co a level of living which we currently can't even hope to achieve. If we look to Norway as a target, and we try to achieve that level of standard of living for everybody, then that's what we're talking about. You can save the planet and be comfortable doing it, but you have to make sure that you are not working to a capitalist system which benefits 1% of the population at the expense of everybody else and everything else, including the planet. Anyway, that's my <laughs> my rant for today. But food for thought, um, <clears throat> at a time when the, the issue of oil revenues is probably at the top of the headlines, remember that we, we know that the unionist press are going to jump on this as a reason why Scotland is not going to be strong enough to become independent. And that's why I think it's time to counter that narrative with this more positive one of a coherent plan for the complete decarbonisation and the greening of an entire country from top to bottom. That's what's needed. That's what is going to fire the imagination of young voters. It's going to give them jobs in the future and it's going to give them stability. They're not going to starve, they're not going to freeze in the winter and they're not going to destroy the planet. All of this can be achieved but it needs the politicians <coughs> to get together, cross parties and do something about it. I think even the Labour Party can contribute to this. The Liberal Democrats even, although I'm not a big fan of either of these parties, would have something to contribute to this. But really, I think it's up to the Greens and the SNP to have a, a powwow, have a war cabinet about how to do it. And not only just have a few sound bites about how they, they want to do this and they want to do that, but actually put in place a concrete plan issue government contracts for firms to come up with ways of doing it because unless you do that the pace of change is going to be too slow if you rely on liberal market forces to get the job done it'll be another century before we move an inch because it's going to happen too slowly this isn't just something that's going to happen to future generations it's happening right now it's happening on our watch and we're just letting it go it needs to be done now. If it's done now, then it's a selling point. We will get our independence, and not only that, but we'll have investment pouring in from all directions because we'll be the country that is going to lead from the front. We'll be the ones who develop the technologies, who work out the strategies for decarbonizing and basically re-oxygenating the planet, getting rid of the carbon, reducing the level back to something sustainable. Right, I have to go. I'll see you all later, but um, have a think about it. And as usual, if you have comments or suggestions, let me know. I'll try and include them in future shows. But we have a choice to make here, and I think we have to be courageous and say, let's let go of the oil. Let's let go of it as a fuel. And let's look at it as a precious resource that needs to be conserved and pumped out slowly uh, and used for specific purposes that can be reused or resold. Let's not burn up our children's future. I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.